Okay, thank you, Eileen, so much. The challenges are immense. Um, so next, uh, David Williams uh, is the Florence and Laura Norman Professor of Public Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Professor of African and African American Studies and Sociology at Harvard University. David is an internationally recognized authority on social influences on health. Uh, his research has un enhanced our understanding of race disparities in health, socioeconomic disparities, and the ways that stress, racism, health behavior, and religious involvement uh, affect health. The everyday discrimination scale that he developed is one of the most widely used measures of discrimination in the field. David is an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine and of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he's one of the most highly cited uh, social scientists of our generation. David has received distinguished contribution awards from the American Sociological Association, the American Psychological uh, Association, and the New York Academy of Medicine, and he served on numerous national committees focused on our nation's population health. His research has also been featured by some of the top news organizations in our country, and his TED Med talk focusing on race and health was released in 2017, and, it, and it's a fantastic one. Thank you, David, for accepting the invitation to talk today, and let's welcome David to the podium. And good morning. It's certainly good to be here with you. Um, and I have a, a task of covering the many storm clouds that are on the horizon uh, for racial, ethnic, and low SES populations. I literally don't have time to discuss all of the issues in detail, but I want to flag multiple issues that we need to think about. Um, and I would also caution that what I have picked is, is relatively selective because there are so many um, storm clouds that we can talk about. So one of them um, that I think builds on Eileen's point is we do have the persistence of racial disparities in health over time. And I've taken a slightly longer uh, time frame, looking from 1950 to the present, but it illustrates one of the points Eileen made. We have had, um, sorry, we have had remarkable um, declines um, in life expectancy over time for both blacks and whites. Um, there still is a gap in, in 2015, but it is much smaller than the gap in, in, in 1950. I also want to highlight the importance of paying attention to intersectionality so that if we look at the changes over time from 1950 um, to, to 2015, um, just looking at race and gender, there are some complexities that emerge that we miss um, just by looking overall. Uh, we see, for example, that black women have had the largest um, life expectancy increase over time of, of, of all groups, which is consistent with work that's been done by George Kaplan, uh, Richard Cooper, showing the impact of the civil rights movement on life expectancy. That, that 19, mid-1960s and 1970s was the greatest narrowing of the black white gap, reflecting greater increases for African Americans compared to whites, and, and African American women had larger gains in income, um, as a result of the policies of the 60s and 70s, and they had commensurate larger gains. But it, th there are complexities that, that, that are illustrated there. Most people are unaware that black women have had higher life expectancy than white males since 1970, uh, for example. Um, and so there's some bullets here of the, the value of the intersectional lens that, that we capture um, that I, I just highlighted. Um, I also want to emphasize, and this is one where I don't have the hard data, but we have enough evidence to suggest it's really important as we look at what is happening with the narrowing of the black-white gap, that we really need to pay attention to migration and its intersection with socioeconomic status to understand the changes that have occurred. Um, the blunt point would be, to what extent has the narrowing of the black-white gap in the last two decades been a function of black migration and do not reflect fundamental changes for the historic disadvantaged black population of the United States. If you look at the work of Todd Hamilton, um, it, it clearly shows the dramatic increase in black migration, dramatic increase in black migration since 1990, particularly from Africa. Um, black immigrants, like immigrants of all other racial groups, have better health than their native-born counterparts and the black immigrants from Africa, um, primarily because of markedly higher, black immigrants from Africa have um, twice as likely as whites to have a college degree 
Um, and so they have a very healthy profile. Um, Todd estimates that now the black population, immigrant population, and their kids are approaching 20% of the black population in the U.S. And it really calls for us to, to disaggregate data so we can really see the trends and, and not um, confuse um, uh, uh, the impact of the change in composition of the black population as a marker of, of markedly improved outcomes for the historic black population in the U.S. I think we also need to look at disaggregated data as we're trying to understand what's happening for the Hispanic population and the Asian population in the United States. Here is um, national data uh, for the U.S. looking at a, a measure of allostatic load. Um, and what it illustrates is that um, if you look to the left is the U.S.-born population, to the right is a foreign-born um, Mexican uh, population. And if you just look at the 45 to 60-year-olds, what you see here is that Mexican immigrants, middle-aged Mexican immigrants, zero to 10 years in the United States, have an allostatic load profile at midlife that is similar to that of whites. By 21 or more years, they have an allostatic load profile similar to that, identical to that of US-born Mexicans, which is not statistically different from that of blacks. So you have the health of, of, of Mexican immigrants changing from a profile similar to that of whites in the early years to 21 or more years similar to that of African Americans. That's markedly um, striking changes in that population over time. And if we just look at data for Latinos in general, we miss um, that kind of variation um, that you find. Here is other national data uh, for the U.S. from a, a report on Hispanic health showing uh, across a broad range of outcomes the profile of, of U.S.-born and foreign-born Hispanics being um, very different. We also need to pay attention to the heterogeneity of the Hispanic population uh, in terms not just of ethnicity, but ethnicity also captures dramatic variation um, in, in kind of human capital resources um, that they bring um, to the U.S. with um, Mexican immigrants, 5% uh, of them having a college degree or more education compared to Venezuelan immigrants with 50%. And, and, and how the, that combination of migration status and SES plays out uh, for the patterns of health is, is an important issue for us to look at. We also need to better understand, I think, how race, ethnicity, and SES relate to each other and combine to affect health across multiple indicators of SES for the broad range of racial ethnic populations and subpopulations. So here is data on life expectancy at age 25. This comes from the National Longitudinal Mortality Study, 1988 um, to 1998. And what we find is that overall, there's a black-white gap of five years at age 25. Within the white population, there's a 6.4 year gap in life expectancy between whites with a college degree and whites with less than high school, and a 5.3 year gap in life expectancy um, uh, uh, within the African American population, highlighting that the overall variation within each racial ethnic group by socioeconomic status is larger than the overall racial ethnic population and reminds us that we need to continue to encourage our health statistics system to, to report more routinely data by race and SES together instead of reporting data only by race, which is what is uh, most typically done. At the same time, at every level of, of, of socioeconomic status, I'm showing you data on education that the same pattern is true uh, for income, there is still a racial gap, a 3.1 year gap between black and whites who have not finished high school, and the gap widens as education increases, and we have this stunning uh, finding that blacks with a college degree, the best of African Americans, still have lower life expectancy than whites with a college degree, and whites with some college, and that whites who have completed high school. How this, these patterns play out for various indicators across various racial ethnic population um, populations is an important issue that we need to pay attention to. I think we also need to pay greater attention to the coverage of all populations, particularly those populations that are very small. 
So I'm going to illustrate that with data on levels of discrimination in the United States from a study done by the American Psychological Association, national data, but oversampled uh, multiple populations. And so for the first time in national data, we have a picture of the levels of discrimination among Native Americans. And what we find is that among three indicators of job discrimination, Native Americans have the highest levels, uh, report the highest levels of discrimination. And if we look at the everyday discrimination scale, uh, one third, 34% of Native Americans, higher than any other group, report experiences of everyday discrimination uh, once a week or more, compared to about a quarter of African Americans and one fifth of Latinos and one tenth of whites. And, and Asians. So again, we, we, we don't know about the Native American experience if we don't um, have data on, on that population. We also need to accelerate research that will help us to better understand the life course and transgenerational sources of racial inequities in health. This is a, a study out of Sweden um, that looked at the relationship between not prenatal stress, but preconception stress, stressors that occurred in the life of the mother six months before a conception. And preconception stress is associated with a 53% higher risk of infant mortality. There is now work out of the U.S. linking preconception stress to low birth weight. So paying attention to that and paying attention to how these things vary across racial ethnic status is an important issue for us to better understand. Here is a, another study looking at the relationship between mother's childhood abuse and how mother's childhood abuse predicts persistent high depressive symptoms across adolescence and young adulthood, um, even after statistically adjusting for multiple risk factors. Again, telling us that we need to better understand life course and generational uh, factors that are contributing uh, to disparities um, in health. Um, the work of Yehuda, for example, highlights the uh, youth studying survivors of the Holocaust, how there are epigenetic alterations that can occur that are evident in the exposed generation that is also evident in the offspring. And I think we really need to bring this perspective more seriously to work on racial ethnic inequities in health. Um, the work of Jean Brody and colleagues looking at discrimination among adolescent, um, African American adolescents in Georgia highlights the importance of, of taking this life course perspective. They assessed levels of discrimination by these teenagers at age 16, 17, and age 18. And by age 20, I didn't say age 40, by age 20, those, male, those adolescents who were high, consistently high on discrimination, report higher ne levels of stress hormones, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, um, inflammation and BMI at age 20. So at age 20, we are seeing systematic, systematic biological dysregulation linked to exposures uh, during their teens. We also need to understand what I call the health costs of adapting well in difficult environments, and we need to understand how we can minimize them. I'm joined here on the work of Gene Brody, along with Edith Chen and Greg Miller, um, uh, they have looked at the cost of resilience in this same sample of African-American uh, teens in, in Georgia. Those who are low socioeconomic status and have exactly what we would want all teens to have, high levels of self-control, high levels of self-regulation, that predicts higher academic involvement and better mental health in their 20s. They're more likely to have gone on to college and they're doing well mental health-wise. At the same time, at the same time, by age 20, they have greater obesity, higher blood pressure, higher stress hormones, and higher levels of epigenetic aging. So these are successful, mental health-wise, successful socioeconomically, but there seems to be a cost. It reminds us of the John Henryism hypothesis of those who strive actively to overcome all odds but lack the resources to um, uh, facilitate that success have cost. And there's been a recent study looking at the ad health data, looking at college completions, and, and is finding a similar pattern for African Americans and Hispanics who, who complete college. And we need to better understand what drives this and what, in fact, we can do to address it. We also need to understand the ways in which the current political environment affects the health of children and adolescents in the United States. 
Uh, during the last election campaign, the Southern Poverty Law Center released a report um, of a, a survey of over 2,000 K-12 teachers in the United States that found 67% of the teachers reported that, that some of their students were expressing fears and concerns about what might happen to their family. More than a third of the teachers said they had seen an increase in anti-Muslim or anti-immigrant sentiment in their classroom. More than half of the teachers reported an increase in civil political discourse among their students, and more than half of the teachers said the students were, some of their students were emboldened to use slurs and name-calling and said bigoted and hostile things. So it, it suggests a, a very hostile environment emerging, and in fact, in the wake of the election, there has been a documented spike in hate crimes and harassment. Importantly, K through 12 schools is the number one site of hostility and hate crime incidents in the United States in the wake of the election. So we really need to think of what impact is that having on, on this generation of young people. There is one study just published um, in JAMA Pediatrics um, out of Los Angeles looking at 11th graders in 10 urban and, and suburban schools um, measured um, in the spring of 2016 their levels of concern and worry about the increase in hostility and discrimination of people because of their race, their ethnicity, their sexual orientation, immigrant status, religion or disability status. And what the study found, that the higher levels of concern among these students was associated with the use of cigarettes, alcohol, marijuana, number of substances, depression, and ADHD symptoms. The kids were followed over time. 42% uh, of the kids at baseline and 45% at follow-up were very or extremely concerned about this increase in discrimination. And what they found, that the increased discrimination um, was more marked among uh, Hispanics and black kids. And change in concern, those who manifested an increase in discrimination uh, from the baseline to uh, one year later was associated with increases in cigarette use, marijuana use, and the number of substances used. The increase uh, in cigarette use was greater for blacks and Hispanics compared to kids of other backgrounds. So this is one piece of evidence suggesting this is affecting adolescent um, uh, health behaviors and, and potentially mental health. Now I talked about the importance of looking at this among um, um, young people. We also need to look at this question among adults. Um, this is a study conducted by the American Psychological Association in January of 2017 that find high levels of Americans of, of, of all racial groups, although you see the rates are higher for blacks, Hispanics, and Asians, uh, said they were, the election outcome was a very significant or somewhat significant source of stress and almost three quarters of Democrats and a quarter of, of Republicans also report that. More generally, we need to understand this in the context of a growing body of work suggesting that hostility within the large environment can adversely affect health. There are multiple recent studies that have documented this. I'm highlighting just one of them uh, that looked at what's the level of discrimination at the county level. So looking at the county in which you live, um, looking at what percentage, proportion of persons who live in that county re reflect uh, racially prejudiced attitudes. And what this study found and multiple other studies have found, if you live in an area of higher levels of prejudice, you have higher death rates. Death rates are higher. There's similar uh, research looking at seeing similar findings for the LGBT population. There's, there's much we need to understand methodologically. The, the, we, we need to understand what are, the what are the mechanisms and pathways, but this consistent pattern across a broad range of outcomes and a broad range of, of measures of, of um, prejudice at the level of the community um, is something that we need to understand. Uh, I think we need to better understand as well the ways in which the current political environment affects the health of immigrants. Um, this is one study I was involved with with colleagues. We looked at the impact of the SB 1070 immigration law in Arizona, which authorized local officials to stop anyone who looked as if they might be illegal. Um, in this study of, of young mothers and their mother figures, we found that in the wake of this law, there was a decline in the use of public assistance and preventive routine care for their kids. And most striking of all, this decline was strongest, was, was greatest among US-born Mexican-American women. 
So those who were not at risk but may have seen this as an absolute affront to their dignity as citizens of the United States were declining in the use of services for their kids. We also have studies that have documented the impact of immigration raids on the health of not just those who were involved, but on the health of the entire community. This is a study of the Postville, Iowa immigration raid, the largest immigration raid ever conducted by federal officials. 900 immigration immigrants descended on a meat processing plant and arrested um, almost 400 um, persons and detained them until their immigration status um, could be assessed. Many families were separated. It had a huge negative impact on the community, with many Latinos feeling un un unsafe and even sleeping in their homes for months and would sleep in churches. This study documented that infants born to Latino mothers in that geographic area the year after the raid showed an increase in low birth weight compared to infants uh, born in the year before the raid. A similar pattern was not evident among the birth for the births of white infants. We also need to identify how to create environments that are more resilient. Um, we, there's a lot of interest, a scientific interest in resilience, but a lot of it is focused on resilience at the individual level, which is important. But we also need to think of the ways in which we can, policy interventions can create resilience um, at, at the level uh, of the larger uh, society. So here is the US on child poverty rates. Um, we rank uh, 34th in the world on the levels of child poverty. And just a reminder that child poverty is not randomly distributed in the United States, but a third of uh, Native American and African American kids almost uh, are poor, uh, and a quarter of, of uh, Latino kids, and 10% uh, of, of Asian and, and white kids. This is a report from UNICEF. What this report illustrates is for different countries, the level of child poverty before taxes and transfers. That's the level of child poverty produced by the economic system of the country. And then the level of child poverty after taxes and transfers, after we have stated our policy preferences, what impact does that have on child poverty? So if you pick the first example, you see in Ireland, the child poverty before taxes and transfers is 42%. But after taxes and transfers, it's reduced to 8%. For comparison, you see in the United States, we have a 24% child poverty rate after taxes and transfers is changed to 23%. So we uh, are not really reflecting the, the priorities we have in terms of, of looking after the well-being of all kids. I think we also need to think of the safety net as a resilience resource and keeping the safety net in place, the, as, as frayed as it currently is, as a resilience strategy. To see what's the negative impact, we simply need to take a walk down memory lane and look at the impact of the Omnibus Reconciliation Act in 1981 during the Reagan administration that led to 500,000 people losing um, med uh, welfare, a million people lost food stamps, 600,000 people lost Medicaid, um, multiple um, community, community health centers closed across the country and there were massive negative effects documented in the American population with children and pregnant women being hardest hit. 143% in anemia in pregnant women, increase in the incidence of low birth weight nationally, increases in infant mortality in poor populations in 20 states, uh, increases levels of children with preventable childhood diseases showing up in emergency rooms in, in Boston, Minneapolis, and Chicago, increases in blood level levels among kids. A broad range of negative effects occurred when the safety net was harmed. So securing the safety net and monitoring the policy changes and generating the data to inform advocacy and keeping and strengthening the very fragile net we have, I think, is an important priority. We also need to better understand and effectively address the deeply embedded racism that is in our culture. Um, it's manifested in multiple ways, but I'll illustrate that by just uh, high levels of negative stereotyping. And we need to think of its implications for political support to address racial inequalities. This is a paper just published a couple weeks ago uh, with other colleagues. We looked at a national sample of whites who work or volunteer with children. And 52% of, of those whites report that blacks are prone to violence, 
43% uh, say that Latinos are prone to violence compared to 22% say that whites are prone to violence, and 29% say that American Indians and Arab Americans are prone to violence. This study asked people not only about their beliefs about these characteristics in adults, but also in teens and kids. I will show you the data for children. These are children 0 to 10 year olds. So 23% of whites who work or volunteer with children in the United States believe that young black kids under the age of 10 are prone to violence. And 16% believe that young Latinos uh, are prone to violence. So very high levels of negative stereotype that, that exist. Why does this matter? And what are three communication challenges I think we face as a nation? We need to raise awareness levels of the problems of inequities in our society and health. We need to build a science base that will guide us in developing the political will to address racial and SES inequities in health. And we need to build empathy. That is, identify how to tell the story of the challenges of the disadvantage in ways that resonates with the, with, with the public. Um, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote a book on the Philadelphia Negro in 1899, has a chapter um, on Negro health, and towards the end of that chapter, he says the biggest problem with Negro health is what he calls the peculiar attitude of the nation, the indifference of the population uh, towards the challenges they face. Here is one study that illustrates this. Doesn't prove it, but, but it's one study of, of the work documenting an empathy gap. A study of mainly white kids at age five, seven, and 10. At age five, they are shown a picture of a person, either a white person or a black person, being stuck with a needle. There is no racial bias at age five. By age seven, there's a tendency for the white kids to see the black person suffering less, and by age 10, it is pronounced. So as young as 10, we see a, a stable difference of the actual identical behavior being interpreted differently with not having a lack of empathy. I think we really need to build a science base that will guide us to identify how do we tell the story, how do we break through these dominant frames that our populations have. And we need to also need research to help us to identify how can we reduce the perception of inequities as politically contentious and polarizing. And then we need to build empathy so that we can build the political will to develop a commitment and meaningful agenda to reduce inequities in health. Thank you.